Hi everyone, so this is my um, video for phase one of lesson two. Um, so for my lesson, I chose to focus on writing instruction, um, partially because my emergent bilingual that I am working with seems to struggle more with writing. Um, she does really well with reading comprehension and she can write, she just seems to struggle with expressing her thoughts um, and working independently on actual writing. Um, so that's sort of why I picked that. Um, part of also why I picked it is that in chapter six, Proctor talks about how students need challenging content. Um, and truthfully, analytical writing, which is what we focus on a lot, um, is challenging content because they're having to combine, my students are having to combine their understanding of the text that they're reading, of the reading, their comprehensions. They're having to combine that with deep thinking and being able to express it with original thought. Um, and that is a really challenging activity for most of my students, let alone um, emergent bilinguals, especially when you factor in that they have to use a formal objective tone throughout um, as well. That can be sort of challenging. So it, it fits that challenging content that students need. Proctor also notes in chapter six that when you combine writing instruction, with reading strategy instruction, then students make significant gains on assessment. I've spent a lot of time at the beginning part of my semester doing reading strategy instructions, how to summarize, how to break down sections of a text, um, understand their contribution to the whole, and things like that. So by combining that with writing instruction, particularly many lessons to improve writing, then they should see significant gains on their assessment, particularly their English 2 EOC, which they will take at the end of next year. So we're really building the background for that and really hoping that they'll do super great. Um, so for my lesson plan, what I've decided to do is really focus on analysis because that's where my emergent bilingual seems to struggle the most. Um, and it not only will benefit her, but benefit her entire class as well because they all, I mean, they all struggle with it. Um, so the sort of model that I'm using is Columbo's model of interactive writing that she talks about in unit seven. Um, so basically, interactive writing is a model and a scaffold for English language learners um, or emergent bilinguals. Um, so basically, what's going to end up happening is I will model for my students how to incorporate good analysis, break down what makes good analysis, um, and then we'll start to scaffold where we will do an example together where we are creating good analysis based on a claim and a quote that is provided to us. Um, we'll work together on that and then I will release it into group work where they are then working together to do the same process. And then on their own, they'll be taking what they wrote together um, and turning it into a paragraph where they will then share and give each other feedback. Um, so this interactive writing model was based on sociocultural theory where the idea of working with mixed levels, um, of children and students who have mixed levels of writing ability, um, it improves writing. So when I do this activity, the students will be grouped in a mixed level group um, where some of my really high kids who are really good um, with analytical writing already will work with some of my lower level analytical kids, my kids who mostly just summarize or repeat what the quote says or repeat what the text says. Um, and they'll work together to sort of help each other improve um, as well. So with interactive writing, we start with a skill. And that skill turns into a mini lesson, which is what you'll see me modeling. And then it becomes interactive writing. So that's when we're doing the we do together part. And then eventually that'll turn over into they're working together in groups and then them working by themselves. So I'm going to go ahead and teach, sort of teach it. Um, I will be walking back and forth so that way you can see my screen and I will have to change things on my screen as well. So just be aware of that. So at this part of my lesson, this is the start. So this is where I would be modeling and saying that today we are working on analysis, right? Because analysis is the heart of our writing that we're doing. It is the heart of our analytical writing. It gives us better base for our writing than just giving quotes and talking about what the quotes say and then moving on. Um, and that it benefits our reader. And so that the best way to craft good analysis is 
thinking about the analysis explains how your evidence supports your claim. So it's kind of like a math equation that you get analysis when you add claim and evidence together. When you connect the two, that is how you get good analysis. Analysis is not simply just repeating our quote, it is combining what the quote says with our claim. So we're going to then look at a model right here um, of what good analysis means. So this is a paragraph. So I would read the paragraph out loud to my students who can see this on the board. So reusable products are better than single-use plastic because they are better for our environment. Some people do not believe that single-use plastic is too detrimental to our environment, but the opposite is in fact true. The Washington Post notes that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's New Plastics Economy reported predict, report predicted that by 2050, there could be more plastic in the world's oceans than fish by weight. If we were to use reusable products such as cloth shopping bags or metal water bottles, we would be able to reduce the amount of plastic in the ocean. Fish can choke on these plastics, ingest them, or get trapped in them, which decreases the fish population, which is vital not only for our food supply, but also for the ecosystem within the ocean. By making the choice to refill a metal water bottle instead of tossing away a single-use plastic bottle, we are aiding not only the fish, but ourselves as well. So when I read that, I realize I read that kind of fast. I will slow down. I can be a fast talker, particularly when I'm by myself. Um, so then I have four guiding questions down here where we'll be talking with our students together. So I would say, well, what is the claim? You would see that I have a sentence in bold, I have part in italics, and I have part in underline. So I'd have my students say, which part is the claim? Hopefully they would say the bolded sentence, reusable products are better than single-use plastic because they are better for our environment. Um, so then we talk about, well, why is that the claim? Can we tell that that's what someone is arguing about? Can we tell that that is the stance that they are taking? And then I would say, well, what is the evidence? Where is our quote? What is the evidence we're using to support our claim? Hopefully, fingers crossed, they would point to this italicized part that the Washington Post notes that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's New Plastics Economy report predicted that by 2050, there could be more plastic in the world's oceans than fish by weight. Um, and then we would really get into, well, where is the analysis? And I'm hoping that they would figure out that it's the underlying part. And then we would be talking about, well, why is this effective? First thing we're going to say is, does it just repeat the quote? It doesn't just repeat that there's going to be more fish, or sorry, more plastic than fish. So we would spend some time talking about, okay, well, why is it bad to simply repeat your quote? Why is that not showing deep thinking? And then we talk about, well, how does this analysis here show deep thinking? So what this is doing is it's saying, what's going to happen if we have more plastic than fish. So we're thinking deeply about, okay, well, what would happen in the world if there were fewer fish out there? What would happen to us? What would happen to nature? And then we're thinking a step further and saying, well, what could we do to combat that? And that's how this analysis brings in um, using cloth shopping bags or refillable water bottles. So then we would say, very good, that was great analysis. And then that's when we get into that we are going to do this together first. So there are three parts to this crafting good analysis practice. So part one is what we're going to do together as a class. So we would be doing the same thing together that I just modeled for them on the screen. So I would have this up here and what I'm actually going to do is have a student come over to my whiteboard and sort of scribe for us. Um, as we are writing our analysis, that way everyone can see. They will have paper copies in front of them. So one student will be scribing on the board and everyone else will be responsible for writing down. That way my only job is sort of to facilitate um, the mini lesson, facilitate the discussion and assist them rather than me spending time writing. So I would say, okay, I have given us a claim here that students should not get their college acceptances revoked based on past behaviors. So then we would spend some time, hope, if they don't understand it, we spend some time dissecting what does that mean. Okay. And then I give them a quote that supports that. 
education is about improvement. It is rooted in the faith that ignorance can be enlightened. Okay. And then I would be saying, okay, so now we need to come up with our analysis. We're not writing a full paragraph here. We just need to figure out, okay, how could we connect this quote to our claim? How can we show that what is said here, that education is about improvement, it is rooted in the faith that ignorance can be enlightened? How does that prove that students should not get their college acceptances revoked based on past behaviors? And so we would spend some time talking about that and how, um, how we can analyze that and sort of saying, okay, well, if education is about improvement, then what good are we doing to individuals by taking away their opportunities to learn and flourish and become better people? If education really is about improvement, not only in academic skills, but also in life skills, then why should we take that away from someone based on a decision they made when they were, let's say, 15? You know, when they were ninth graders, do they want their ninth grade um, actions to reflect on them four years down the line when they are um, hopefully going to colleges? Um, so we would do that together. Our individual would scribe on the board, they would have that down. And then I would go over the remainder of the activity that they're doing together. So I would say, okay, now that you've, we've done this together, you're doing the same exact thing in your groups. So I put them in their groups and I would go over what each of these claims are and what they mean. So I'd say, okay, you have four um, claim evidence analysis boxes to work through with your group. So the first one, the claim is prisoners should be given the right to vote because it holds politicians accountable for prison conditions. The second claim is college athletes should be paid fairly for their talents and hard work. The third one is the 2020 U.S. Census should not include a question about citizenship. And the last one is high schoolers should take a personal finance course as part of their general curriculum. Um, I picked these topics just because they're what's important to my students. I tried really hard to keep it not political. Um, you know, nothing really about gun control or border control or things like that just because they'd be tempted to put in their own opinions. Um, I wanted to try and keep it as objective as possible while still being interesting to them in their lives. Um, so then I would put them in their groups and they would work together. Um, I would be walking around and sort of, you know, my goal is to get to each group and work with each of them on one um, and say, okay, let's talk about this third one right here. Um, and work on this together. So that way we have a joint productive activity where I'm working with a smaller group to create something together. Um, and then that should take hopefully like 15 minutes or so. And then once we wrap up from that, then I would give them part three. So for part three, they would go back to their individual work. Now we're in the um, you do by yourself. And I would say, okay, part three says, now on your own, choose one of the practices we just completed and write a full paragraph using claim, evidence, and analysis. So they would get their choice of whether or not they wanted to do the personal finance, the college athletes getting paid, the prisoners having the right to vote, um, and they would turn that into a full paragraph um, where they would then have to use skills such as incorporating the quote and not just plopping it in. Uh, making connector sentences, using transitions, things like that. So I'm going to give them probably about five, seven minutes for that, maybe 10 if absolutely needed. Um, and then they'll come together based on the topic that they chose. So if I said, okay, if you chose to write your paragraph about college athletes should be paid fairly for their talents and hard work, all of those students will get together. All of my students who wrote about prisoners having the right to vote, they will get together. And what they are going to do then is read their paragraphs aloud to each other and the individuals within the group are responsible for giving one glow and one grow um it's a practice that we use in here pretty often so they understand that giving a glow means that you tell them something they did really well um, and then hopefully that relates to their analysis um, and then they give them one grow so a suggestion for what they could do better next time Maybe it's another thought on how they could have analyzed it a different way or how they could transition their analysis better um, or things like that. So then after that, we would sort of come together and if anyone wants to share theirs out loud, they are more than welcome to. Um, and we'll do a quick little wrap up of how do we feel 
um, about analysis after that. Okay. So as far as my reflection goes, um, I tried really hard to scaffold this lesson in particular because I do know that um, analysis can be hard. And I really did try to incorporate more student talk rather than me talking. Um, but if there are any suggestions on how to improve the student talk, um, that would be beneficial, particularly in a class that is as quiet as my second block. Um, sometimes when I'm asking them to interact as a whole group, like with me and have them build off of each other, um, they really struggle with that. They really want me to sort of lead the discussion, ask questions, they answer, and then we move on. Um, so if anyone has any suggestions as far as how to improve that, um, or if there's just anything in general um, that you could see as doing better, I tried really hard to make this as engaging for them as possible. I realize it might not be as fun, so there may need to be a fun aspect thrown in there to try and engage them more with analysis in a way that's not super boring. Um, that's kind of my worry here a little bit too. Um, but overall, I'm thinking and hoping it'll go well because it is mini lesson style. It's the interactive writing, it's scaffolded. Um, but any suggestions that y'all have are always welcome um, because we're all learning from each other too. What, what greater job is there than teaching where we encourage collaboration? So thank you very much for watching and I hope y'all have a great day.